sounded on flying mode, the first of a flight of five from the Royal Air Force Coastal Command Station at Pembroke Dock is headed due north for the Arctic on a special mission. Its destination is Young Sound, a remote but sheltered fjord on the northeast coast of Greenland. These Sunderlands of number 230 squadron are charged with the task of bringing back to this country the British North Greenland expedition led by Commander Simpson. This expedition has been engaged on scientific research in the Arctic for over two years. Two years in the bleak and silent world of the explorer. Throughout this period, the expedition was aided by the Royal Air Force, its main link with civilization. A series of airlifts helped to establish the base camp at Britannia Lake, and later, supplies were dropped from the air to the advance party on the ice cap. Back again at Young Sound, the Royal Air Force men who were to fly the expedition home set about making their base fully operational so that food and essential gear and materials could be offloaded without delay, jetties out in the sound were first made ready. Another priority job was the improvisation of this trapper's hut as a camp cookhouse. For the camp cook, things were pretty much the same as usual. Potatoes, you know, must be peeled even in the Arctic. Examining the rudders of these launches left behind on an earlier visit provided an opportunity for testing one of the Arctic survival suits that had been brought along. Unfortunately, on this job, the airman couldn't wear any protection on his hands and, well, as you see, he certainly felt the lack of it. As work progressed on the ground, the Sunderland pilots made short local flights so as to become fully acquainted with the area. Work went ahead steadily, and before long, the base was ready. Squadron leader Bennett, who was in charge of the operation, briefed the air crews who were to pick up the explorers and their equipment, and the flying boats were airborne once more. Their course to the expedition's base camp at Britannia Lake, some 180 miles further north, took them along the edge of the Greenland ice cap. Unmapped and unexplored, this part of Greenland presented to the Sunderland crews a seemingly unending panorama of frozen wastes passing beneath their aircraft. At Britannia Lake, the crews went ashore where they were greeted by Commander Simpson and members of the expedition. Simpson and his men, in the course of their two years' work, had trekked hundreds of miles by sledge and dog team, gathering scientific information about northern Greenland. Now, the flying boat crews were short of a hearty welcome when they produced a large batch of mail for the expedition. These um, husky dogs had been with the expedition throughout their stay. Now they faced another long journey. First, they were to return to Pembroke Dock with the Sunderlands, and then, after a few weeks in England, depart on the 10,000-mile sea voyage to the Falkland Islands in the Antarctic, to join the dog teams working there. Lieutenant Commander Brett Knowles, the expedition's radio expert, quickly dismantled the communications equipment. Meanwhile, the rest of the gear was transferred to the Sunderlands, riding at anchor on the lake.
At last, they were able to take off. And as the roar of the powerful radial engines echoed through the surrounding hills, the tenancy of the British North Greenland expedition at Britannia Lake came to an end. For the last time, these Royal Air Force flying boats passed over the forbidding ice cap to find at Young Sound an even greater menace developing. Dangerous mist and drifting ice flows had made an unexpectedly early appearance in the Sound. The Sunderlands managed to alight safely through the mist, but it was clear that they would have to evacuate Young Sound without delay. A constant guard was maintained day and night to see that the ice flows kept clear of the flying boats. For even a small ice flow would smash the hull of a Sunderland as if it were an eggshell. On shore, radio messages were flashed to home station to warn them that the aircraft would be leaving Young Sound ahead of schedule. Working against time, the men made a concentrated effort to get the equipment aboard the aircraft. Before it was loaded, each item had to be individually weighed. To avoid the additional hazards of a long takeoff run, each Sunderland's cargo had to be kept as light as possible. Everybody lent a hand, and the work of ferrying everything out by pontoons went on throughout the night. there remained only a few last-minute jobs. All unwanted rubbish was burned on a huge bonfire, and this signaled the end of their stay at Young Sound. Out on the Sunderlands, refueling was completed, and the navigators plotted their course home. From the shore, the last dinghy pulled away from the deserted base. Air crews at their posts took a last look at their camp, and then the 2,000-mile flight home began. The flying boats succeeded in lifting clear of the ice flows, and as they turned on course, the crews and the passengers could see the massive field of ice still pressing into the field. Safely airborne, they made for their first stopping place, Reykjavik in Iceland, and after refueling there, they set course for the last lap of their homeward journey. Pembroke Dock, where service chiefs, wives, children and messmates waited to greet them, the Sunderlands peeled off to land on the more hospitable waters of their home base. There were cheers for all those concerned with the venture, and Commander Simpson was taken ashore to be congratulated by his admiral and the Chief of Coastal Command on the success of his expedition. A success shared by the men of the expedition and the Royal Air Force men who'd operated the airlift to that remote and hazardous region.
for the flying crews, it had been an adventure which had carried with it valuable experience and training in the art of flying and survival in Arctic regions. For the Huskies, well, a featherbed existence for a while, and then back to the hard, vigorous life for which nature had so fully equipped them. In fact, a tough dog's life. 